everyone. I think we've gone live here on Zoom, and uh, if you give me a few minutes here, we're going to go live on Facebook. So I'll hold off just a little bit until I get a cue that we're live on Facebook. Okay. Okay, so I guess we're live on Facebook as well. So uh, let me first welcome everyone to the uh, second seminar in the Society for Marine Mammology's Editors Select Seminar Series. Um, let's see. First, let me start out by telling everyone that um, the paper that today's, tonight's talk, I guess it could be today for some people, um, the, the talk um, will be have open access in marine mammal science. So if you don't have access to marine mammal science, you'll be able to obtain the paper if you'd like. So um, my name is Daryl Boness, and I'm the editor in chief for marine mammal science. Um, the last, uh, last month we had the first seminar in this series. It's a series that, um, uh, uh, presentations are based on papers that are published in marine mammal science and the papers um, chosen to uh, be presented are chosen by the uh, board of editors for the journal. And tonight we have um, Dr. Sean Brilliant um, with us to give a presentation on a paper of his that was uh, actually, I'm not even sure if it's actually published yet. It may be an early view, but not in an issue yet. Uh, Sean uh, attended the University of New Brunswick in St. John and um, completed his bachelor's degree there and also a master of science. His bachelor degree was in marine biology and his master's was in pollution ecology. Sean then went to Australia to do his PhD work on uh, marine ecology at the Center for Research on Ecological Impacts of Coastal Cities, and that was at the University of Sydney. Following his PhD, Sean was a World Wildlife Fund Canada postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University. Um, dur during that time, he developed a movement model for right whales to predict where and when they might be at risk of entanglement. Sean is also a former executive director of the Atlantic Coastal Action Program St. John, which was a nonprofit environmental management organization in Brunswick, and he also taught at the university there. Sean has been the senior conservation biologist for the Canadian Wildlife Federation National Marine Conservation Program since 2010. So we're really pleased to have Sean here tonight. Um, and he'll be talking about his work assessing the lethality of ship strikes on whales using simple biophysical models. Um, you've had a couple of chats already uh, from Charles uh, telling you to use the Q&A for questions you might have uh, rather than the chat. Um, and uh, I think he also gave a link to the uh, paper in marine mammal science. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean to uh, start his presentation. Sean, thank you. Thank you, Daryl. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, really thrilled to be here and, and really honored to be invited to, to come and give this presentation on behalf of my co-authors. I'm going to jump right into this. I have a lot to, to chat about and I'm going to move through it kind of quickly and I'm really interested in getting to the, the, the discussion and the questions. So I'll try and move right along. Um, I published this paper with Dan Kelly, who's a physical oceanographer from Dalhousie University, and my other co-author is James Vlasic, who is a, who was a student, is now a graduate of both Dalhousie University 
and he's an engineer, uh, uh, has an engineering degree as well. <clears throat> this uh, project um, very quickly is, is a, it was, a very, was very much a collaboration project as, as you heard from that uh, description. Um, my background's not on biophysical models or anything. Um, this is really where the strength of, of Dan and James came in um, in their familiarity with, with physics in particular and, and biophysical models. And so it was a real collaboration sort of across uh, disciplines in some ways. And, and I think we, uh, we all had an opportunity to learn quite a bit, <clears throat> in particular me. Um, one of the things I was thinking as I was putting this presentation together is in the title, you know, we've identified this uh, assessment process using simple biophysical models. And I'll mention this a few times. I was thinking, um, you know, these are, rel these are relatively simple models in the sense that they're not complex, finite uh, uh, element models of, of any sort. Um, they're not simple in the sense that I'm kind of boasting as if, you know, uh, uh, it was something that was easy to do. So they have some complexity, but, but in fact, they're fairly straightforward. So, uh, okay, well, let me get started here. <clears throat> Make sure I can actually change my slides, eh? Great. So um, first up, uh, I think everybody's very aware that ship strikes is, is an issue that's global of concern and has been shown to be a, a real problem for a lot of species around the world. Um, increasingly, there's a lot of management and work around managing ship traffic, especially in areas where there is a lot of whales and possibility of whale strike. There have been a number of analyses on this, in particular examining the lethality of ship strikes. Um, these are based on a number of kind of simple analyses. Um, there was a, a paper that came out in 2005, a poster actually, um, that sort of presented a methodology for do, doing this. It, uh, Vanderlyn and Taggart published a, a paper in 2007 that sort of presented a, a model based on the speed of vessels and examining the lethality in relation to that speed. And finally, another paper was eventually published, sort of doing the same thing in a slightly different way and dealing with speed and uh, the lethality of collisions with, with large whales. And in the last case for this last paper, it was on right whales. And, and this was in 2013. And these are the papers that sort of established that speed is an important function when it comes to whether or not a ship strike will kill a whale or not. Now, uh, to jump around a little bit here, in 2017 in Canada, in Eastern Canada, we had 12 right whales die in Canadian waters. <clears throat> um, this was the first of uh, two actually unusual mortality events or one prolonged unusual mortality event that's taking place in Canada. Uh, the right whales have shifted their habitat they showed up in an area where we were unprepared for them to show up. And as a result um, of ship strikes and entanglement and fishing gear, their numbers are plummeting. But as a result of these dead animals and the necropsies that were done on them, um, this drew a lot of attention, of course, to the issue of ship strikes as well as entanglements. And it started, we started asking some questions. I should also mention, um, you know, uh, if there are some gruesome pictures in this, but not very many. So please bear with me. Um, these are both um, floating dead whales that were found in the Gulf of St. Lawrence of Canada. One of the things that we notice in these patterns is during the necropsies of these and many other animals, not simply right whales, but many large whales, um, up to 20 to 30 percent of animals that were have determined to have been killed as a result of blunt force trauma, uh, right whales in particular, had no broken bones. And in particular, the necropsies that were done on the whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in 2017, three, uh, four of those animals were determined to have been killed because of blunt force trauma, and three of those had no broken bones as well. And so what they all had, of course, was massive hemorrhages um, in, in their bodies. But what this kind of said is it said, well, you don't need to apply so much stress to a whale to break its bone to cause it to die. It can take less stress than that. And that got me and many people thinking about, well, what are the, what's the physics that's involved in ship strikes when, when a ship runs into a whale? And that's where this work started. So the first thing we wanted to know is what are the reactive forces that are involved in a vessel strike when a vessel strike starts or, or happens, right? So um, the basic model is this, is that we have a large mass ship, which is much larger than a smaller mass whale. The ship is moving at a at a given speed and colliding with the whale. Now, one of the things in this uh, first step model is what we call the one layer model, where we did try to take into account the fact that the whale has a layer around it. This is the tissue or the blubber that the whale has around it. 
And so when the larger moving object collides with the, the smaller moving object, what's going to happen is that tissue layer or that layer between these two masses is going to be compressed. So this thickness of a layer, this L amount is compressed by a certain amount because of this um, interaction between these two bodies. So this is the most basic model to explain how this is going. Now, where we go from here is to the simpleness because we go to Mr. Isaac Newton here and to his second law specifically where force is equal to mass times acceleration. So if you are gonna move a body and accelerate it or uh, increase its speed to a certain speed, um, you can calculate the force using this equation. And this is where um, much of this work first derives from because this is essentially what we're dealing with is two bodies acting on each other and, and the forces that are involved in, in that interchange. <clears throat> the other thing we're dealing with, of course, is this uh, layer around the animal. And so what we need to know is we need to know how that material reacts to a force that's acting on it. And it's, uh, this is the equation that we deal with, which is, of course, the area over which a force is being applied, the elastic modulus of the material, and the proportion of change of that layer that expresses just how compressed, for example, that layer could be. In other measures, you could measure how much it's being stretch, stretched, but this is the this is the equation that we're using to, to figure out how that layer is reacting to that force. The elastic modulus, by the way, is a, an engineering term. Um, it's basically the squishiness of a material. That's how I tend to understand it as the biologist here. So, you know, some materials such as a mattress here is, are going to be, uh, are going to give much more and easier to compress. Um, other materials such as wood or, or metal are not so easy to compress, but still have an elastic modulus. And this is the the property of that material to, to compress and the forces that are involved in compressing that material. So this is the, the basic, the basis of, of many of the equations that we're working on. We then elaborated the system from what I described as the one layer system. And we were like, well, really a whale has many layers in it. So we built what we call a four layer system here. And so we conceptualized the whale as having four layers of tissues, a skin layer on the outer, Part of the body, a blubber layer, what we call a sublayer, which is in fact could be organs, could be muscles, could be other tissues, and then a bone ultimately um, in the center of this body. <clears throat> and so this, this, these four components comprise the four layer system and, and each of the layers that we are dealing with and trying to understand the, 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 the physical forces, the physical stresses that are being applied to a whale during a vessel strike. So um, this, uh, the reactive forces that we wanted to try and predict for when a, a vessel collides with a whale, when a vessel penetrates into a whale um, is derived from two types of reactive forces. Uh, pardon me, and this schematic is just sort of showing the four layers, if you can see from skin on the outside to blubber to sublayer and to bone and a, and a vessel penetrating into the body of the whale and essentially compressing the blubber layer in this case and, and depending on the, the, the forces, the stress involved, it may be compressing other layers as well. There are two parts to these reactive forces. The first is this compressive um, force, um, which is a function of the area, of course, that's causing the impact. So it's a, it's a product of that area and the stress involved in the collision. And there's also an extensive uh, an extension force. So this is where the skin is actually being stretched because it's actually stretching and increasing in length as it's being pushed into the body of the whale. And this also is, uh, is a function of the area, but in, in the two dimensions of the area that are receiving that amount of stress, stress here is identified as this small sigma, which is the engineering representation of stress. The calculation of the stresses that are involved are derived from this equation, which is a stress strain relationship. So it, it helps or it defines the relationship between uh, a body that is increasingly under a stress and, and being compressed. But at the same time, as that, as that tissue is being compressed and squished, if you will, the, the forces that are involved with doing that squishing is changing. And, and this relationship, this equation defines that relationship and allows us to derive <clears throat> both the compressive and the extension forces that are involved in these reaction forces. Okay, right? So here's <clears throat> ultimately the model that we're dealing with. We have a ship and we have a ship colliding with the whale. We are keeping track of the uh, 
the reactive forces to the compression, um, the, you know, the resistance of the whale's body to the, to the ship striking it. We are looking at the extension and the extension uh, stress or, or, or forces that are working on the skins, the whale's skin as it's being pushed into its body. We also looked at the water drag on the whale. As you're pushing a whale through the water, there is some resistance there compared to an air. It's, it's a little bit more. And we also keep track of the, the ship thrust. And this is the speed and velocity of the ship as it's moving forward into the, into the whale. So these are the four parameters <clears throat> that comprise the model, the, the sort of the understanding and the Newtonian physics that's involved in, in evaluating the stresses that are involved. Now there are a number of variables that we can put into this and modify to calculate these stresses. Um, we can look at the, we can change the mass of the whale. We can change the mass of the vessel, the speed of the vessel, the area of contact, whether it's a small area or a broad area that's hitting the whale. And as well, we can change the thicknesses of each of the four layers in the whale model that we have. So we can adjust all of these variables and come up with estimates of of the amount of stress that's being placed on the whale as a result of the collision. Um, calculating the area was a little bit complicated. I want to mention that very quickly. So this is a bulbous bow on a very large cargo vessel that I um, borrowed from the internet somewhere. Um, and as you can imagine, a whale that would be hit by this is, is a, a very a relatively round object that's running into another relatively round object. And we had to, we had to do a bit of calculations and estimates about what the area of contact would be. In this case, this is a lot like a ball peen hammer hitting a nail or something. So it's a relatively small contact area, creating quite a bit of stress. Similarly, we looked at relatively smaller vessels, such as fishing vessels, and took a look at the hulls of these things and the shapes that they have and getting an understanding of what the, the front area would be if it collided with a round whale, for example, and what that area would be, because these were important parts of the calculations. And we made some uh, estimates of what these are and some generalizations, but we built it into the model so that it could be adjusted. So if we're wrong, or if there's a special case, these can all be adjusted in, in the model as a variable and, and still get some interpretable results. Um, this used to be a slide that I would put at the end of, of this presentation, or I was thinking about putting at the end of this presentation, but I wanna bring this up now because there's a number of things I would like people to keep in mind as, we, as I finish talking about this model um, that we're talking about. The first thing is that tonnage is not mass. Um, this is a confusing thing and I've seen uh, other scientists get confused by this as well. Tonnage in vessel uh, nautical speak is a measure of volume, not mass. Um, so uh, a ton is essentially uh, about three meters squared or about a hundred square feet on a boat. And it just it, it defines how much cargo a vessel can carry. So when I talk to some people and I say, oh, you know, this is whatever a 40 ton vessel. And they say, oh, well, my, my vessel is only, a, I've only got 10 tons gross registered tonnage, you know? And I'm like, well, that's a volume. And, and I want to remind everyone that tonnage is not a, a mass, a measure of mass in these types of things. You need to look at displacement of a vessel or lightweight or dead weight of a vessel. And these are the things that refer to the mass of the vessel. So keep that in mind, please, if, if you're thinking about examples of your own. The other thing I want to mention is we are only dealing with compressive injuries. Um, we are not dealing with the numerous other injuries that may arise as a result of a vessel colliding with a large whale, such as lacerations when the hull cuts across a body and may actually uh, incise and, and, and cut open the body, or of course, propeller injuries. And we do want to emphasize that the compressive forces of a collision aren't the only lethal effect. There are numerous other lethal effects that may be occurring in a collision between a vessel and a whale. Um, and we're simply not dealing with those in this model. And I want to remind us all of that. Similarly, our estimates are only looking at the first initial impact. It is entirely possible that the vessel will continue to thrust into the whale and there'll be subsequent impacts that can occur. And this is only dealing with that first initial impact on the animal. Um, we looked at instantaneous acceleration. So we do have estimates of just how quickly the, the whale is undergoing acceleration. This is important for soft tissue shearing injuries. In humans, we talk about it like concussions or soft tissue injuries, but we are able to evaluate those things because we can look at the sudden acceleration that the whale is, is exposed to uh, and the injuries it may cause. 
And I just want to note that there's a lot of other complicated things that happen in a collision, and we've simplified some things. For example, we're only dealing with T-bone collisions, normal forces, this is called. So we're not dealing with glancing blows or oblique collisions. We're dealing with the whale as a point mass when in fact it's an articulated body. So, so for me, you know, if I get slapped in the face, my head will, will move and turn. My whole body doesn't move just because I get slapped. So we've, we've simplified it in some ways. So these are just some simple points I want you to keep in mind as, we, as I continue to walk you through the model and, and show you what we're able to see. Okay. So <clears throat> this is a Cape Islander, we call it. Uh, it's a typical lobster fishing boat from the east coast of Canada. Um, they weigh uh, up, up to about 45 tons. They can be a little lighter than that. But if we say, okay, we've got a 45 ton Cape Islander and it collides with an adult uh, right whale. Most of what I'm gonna be talking about here, we've used adult right whales as the default model that we're working with. But as I'll try and remember to say again later, we've designed the model so that it can accommodate any species of whale of any size as well. But the default model that I'll talk about is right whale since it's an area and an issue that we're dealing with that's specific to this region. 45 ton Cape Islander doing 10 knots, which is perhaps about the full speed of a Cape Islander collides with the whale. What do we get after all of those equations? About 0.45 megapascals of stress on the whale. Hmm? Okay. How about a 30,000 ton cargo vessel, the bulbous bow, moving along at also at 10 knots, which is generally considered a, a safe <clears throat> or slower speed restriction, pardon me. If it collides with an adult right whale, center of body, direct uh, T-bone collision, what well, we're looking at about 0.95 megapascals. So we have the ability to calculate the stresses of these collisions now. Now the question was, well, what does that mean? This is kind of the second part of what we did in this paper is we said, can we attribute the consequences of these reactive forces uh, from observed events that we know happened in the world. So we went into the literature and into different reports and scavenged as many observations of we, as we could, which turned out to be 34, of large whales that were struck by vessels. But more importantly than that, we needed to know how big the whale was. We needed to know the fate of the whale. Did it live or die? We needed to know the size of the vessel striking it and the speed of the vessel striking it. And, uh, and although the um, data that we could find available on vessel strikes was limited generally, but growing, I understand. Um, once we eliminated stuff that didn't have all of those numbers, we got down to 34 data points. But with all of this information, we could calculate the stress involved with each of these collisions and ultimately the fate of the whale. And so we applied this to um, a logistic curve here. So along the x-axis is the amount of stress. It's expressed as a log base 10, and along the y-axis is what we're calling the probability of lethality. The data points are the triangles in this figure. Um, along the zero, these are the little triangles that are kind of pointing up um, on the bottom of this graph. These are all the ship strikes that occurred on whales that did not kill the whale. We figure didn't kill the whale. Either had a minor injury or no injuries, and the, and the stress that they created. And the triangles along the top of this graph, which are kind of pointing down, um, these are the whales that were seriously injured or perhaps killed as a result of the ship strike uh, correlated with the, the different amounts of stress that the collision caused. We used uh, an equation for logistic uh, curve that identified both this point of symmetry where um, in the middle of this graph, the dotted line, as well as the slope at this point. And we refer to this as tau, tau 50. This is just the point at which the stress level at beyond which, higher than which, we figure there is a better than 50% chance that the whale will die if it's exposed to this kind of stress. And the number in this case was 0.241 megapascals. So any collision uh, where we identified a, a, a ship strike of some sort on a whale of any species, because we dealt with all species in this uh, database because we there just weren't enough to separate them down. Um, anything above 0.241 megapascals is a better than 50% chance of being killed. So now we put it all together so that we could demonstrate and, and understand what these probabilities of lethality are as a result of these ship strikes. To do this, um, of course, we were running a program in R to calculate all these things, but we produced a, a graphic user interface and a, a Shiny app for us, but also uh, we hope to release this for anybody to be able to use to run your own simulations at some point. 
I'll quickly um, point out a few features of this. Um, it may change a little bit by the time we are able to release this. So um, along the top are these blue bars. These are sliders that allow you to adjust all the variables in the equation in the model that I was just talking to you about. So the ship mass, the ship speed, the impact width and height. Um, there's a drop down menu here for uh, identifying which whale species. So you can see in this example, this is just a screen capture, by the way, I can bring up the model if we'd like to look at it, but this is a screen capture of a North Atlantic right whale. The whale length is 13.7 meters, which is an average of the whales that were investigated here in Canada in 2017. And then the thickness of the four tissues, skin, blubber, uh, sublayer and bone thicknesses. And then um, you can, of course, save models and configure your browser and you can bring up different types of data. The, the, the three graphs along the bottom are the default setting right now that I'm going to show you. <clears throat> oh, by the way, as you can see, so this is a 13.7 meter right whale, two and a half centimeter thickness skin, 16 centimeters of blubber, 1.12 uh, meters of sublayer, and then 10 centimeters of bone. This is kind of what we're envisioning based on these necropsies of a strike in the middle, essentially at the back of a whale. Um, this is a strike by a 300 ton vessel doing 20 knots, <clears throat> a fairly small cargo vessel, frankly, um, but going at a fairly typical speed for cargo vessels. The three graphs along the bottom, um, the x-axis in all of these is time. And so this is a collision over a one second period. The first graph is showing simply the position and location of the, the ship and the whale. The ship is identified by a dotted line and the trajectory of, of that in time is, is, uh, is shown. And um, on the bottom of this graph, you can see the acceleration that the ship experiences. It says 0 0.5 Gs. And at the top, you can see the acceleration that the whale experiences. In this case, it's 5.6 Gs. 5Gs, by the way, <clears throat> is, um, is about what it takes to, to jump off the ground. If you jumped, you would be experiencing about 5Gs of force, at least in, for me. Um, for me to get my carcass off this earth takes about 5Gs of force and I can jump in the air. Some people can do a bit more, a bit less, but that's about how much of a, a force 5Gs is. The middle graph here is actually, if you imagine looking down on the different tissue layers of the whale, and we're looking at how much each layer is being compressed over time along the x-axis. So you can see what happens here is that from about 0.1 second to 0.2 seconds, the blubber and the sublayer are completely compressed by this collision. And in fact, the bone has um, received some stress on it as well. In this case, it seems likely the bone will probably break. So that's a compression of all those layers. And the last graph here on the end simply converts those stresses into that probability of lethality. And so you can see over this uh, about, what's that, about a, a 0.2 second collision, the animal go, it, the, the collision goes from about zero to a 100% probability of lethality as a result of this collision. So this is how the model works and what you'll see, and you can change those sliders and change some variables. So let me show you, for example, what if we slow, show, pardon me, what if we slowed this ship down to 10 knots? Well, this is what we see now. This is the exact same thing, a 300 ton, Vessel now slowed down to 10 knots. The whale's only experiencing 3.1 Gs. You can see the collision is slowed down and, and spread over a bit more time. And now, although the blubber layer is being compressed completely, only about half the sublayer is being uh, compressed completely, which is still pretty bad. And in fact, on the last graph, you can see that we're probably pretty close to 90% chance probability of lethality as a result of this. But it does show that there would probably be no stress put on the bone. And so there's likely no bones breaking in this, even though it's a relatively big ship hitting this animal. Let's go look at one more quick example. We'll go back to a 45 ton fishing boat. So uh, doing 10 knots, which is about full speed for these types of boats. Um, the impact area changed because these vessels have a much broader uh, hull that's in the water. And you can see in this case, the whale is experiencing 2.6 Gs of acceleration. The people on the ship would feel 1.2, so very likely would feel something hit the ship. The uh, compression in the whale's body, as you can see, it would basically compress halfway through the, all the way through the blubber and halfway through that muscle layer or sublayer. And once again, the lethality um, peaks at around, uh, I'd say 0.7 or so in, in this graph here. So this is, more likely than not, also a fatal injury, despite being a relatively small vessel moving at a seemingly safe speed. But 
this type of a model and this type of GUI is what we're hoping we'll put out there and people can adjust and use for their own modeling and, and create their own scenarios and see what the probability outcomes are. Ultimately, we put this together into this graph, and this is another figure from the paper. <clears throat> um, along the x-axis is vessel speed. Along the y-axis on the left is the compression stress in megapascals, and we've uh, correlated that or, or lined that up with the probability of lethality on the y-axis on the right. The smallest, thinnest value there is a 45-ton fishing boat, and this shows the relationship between um, vessels and speed and the probability of lethality. So we can see that the, the compression stress and therefore the probability of lethality increases, of course, with speed across these four vessels. But you can see the difference between a 45 ton vessel, a 300 ton vessel, which is this middle sized uh, and middle line. And the thickest line um, at the top here is a 30,000 ton cargo vessel. The first thing that's obvious is there's very little difference between a 300 ton and a 30,000 ton vessel um, when it's colliding with about a 30 ton whale. So um, it doesn't matter if you're 10 times or a thousand times heavier than the whale, it's um, almost the same physics. But what we can see is the tau 50, which is the 50% chance of a lethal event occurring. And now we can see where these lines cross. So for example, for a 45 ton fishing boat, the safe speed, if you collide with the whale is what we predict to be is about 6.6 .6 knots. So if you're going more than 6.6 .6 knots when you collide with the whale, the chance that that whale is gonna die is better than by chance, I guess. And for these larger vessels, it's about four and a half to 4.7 knots um, where they cross that 50% chance. Now around the world, um, the 10 knot speed limit been, is being used as something as a way of slowing down, reducing the lethality to large whales from vessel strikes. But we can see when we draw a line here on the 10 knot speed limit that actually even for uh, fishing vessels, for example, the probability of lethality on a collision at this speed is about uh, 0.69. And for the two large vessels, it's about 0.83 and 0.85. You can imagine that these large cargo vessels here in Canada in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, I think the average speed traveling through the Gulf of St. Lawrence is about 17 knots and it can be up to 20 or 25 knots that these giant vessels are moving through. So you can imagine that this line is actually close to 100% if there was a collision. Bringing the speed down to 10 knots drops this probability down to about 0.83 and 0.85 or so. So a bit of a drop, but not a lot, right? So um, this graph is there and that's how we derived this graph. Once again, this is um, based on the the default value of looking at the right whale, an adult right whale and a normal collision. We also considered in this situation, the relationship between the, the thicknesses of the layers. So um, these two graphs are almost the same. The graph on the left is a graph for a 45 ton fishing vessel. A graph on the right is a 300 ton ship. And the, um, the X axis is the blubber thickness and the Y axis is the sublayer thickness. These dark lines indicate the default settings for the model that I've just been talking about. So if we look at the, the, the point where these two lines intersect, this is essentially that tau 50 mark that we talked about, which is about in, in the case of this 45 ton vessel, just over six and a half knots. But if you strike an animal in a place where it doesn't have as much thickness, such as on the head, it's possible that it might only have five or 10 centimeters of blubber thickness and certainly not much sublayer thickness. So in this case, if we look at a 10 knot uh, pardon me, uh, 10 centimeters of blubber thickness and uh, 40 centimeters of sublayer. Well, now we see that the critical speed is actually three and a half knots. Anything more than three and a half knots is going to result in more likely than not result in a uh, lethality. And the same is true for the large vessels. In this case, a 300 ton vessel. If you strike an animal in the head where it has 10 centimeters of blubber or less and 40, 40, 40 centimeters or less of meat, if you will, any speeds greater than two and a half knots are more likely than not going to result in, uh, in, in a lethal collision. So we wanted to demonstrate that the relationship between this critical speed, but also recognizing that over an animal's body, including mine, I have an uneven distribution of fat and muscle across my body. And so um, we recognize that not all ship strikes happen in the center of mass. And in fact, um, it could be a worse or perhaps in some cases better as well. So um, I, I'm just going to conclude here. So there are two major conclusions that we've sort of come up with 
through this paper and, and I really appreciate everyone taking the time to, to listen to this sort of explanation of this paper and I encourage you to take a look at the paper as well. Um, the first is that small vessels cannot be ignored. Um, this is often met with surprise, particularly by skippers of these fishing vessels. Um, many people are surprised to think that these vessels could cause lethal ship strikes on whales. But um, the analogy I often use is, you know, if a Sean sized thing ran into me at 10 knots, which is about 18 kilometers an hour, chances are I'm going to be rather seriously injured, um, possibly require hospitalization. And these vessels are essentially the same size as a whale and a lot less squishy. Uh, they don't deform quite as easily. So, um, you know, this research is mostly about can these vessels cause lethal injuries? And I keep saying, yes, I think we're demonstrating that they can. It's not answering the question, have they caused lethal injuries? That's not, that's outside the scope of what we've looked at. But the important conclusion here is we can't discount these, these small vessels. We actually need to continue to manage them. We can't um, just assume that they are, are safe for large whales. The second major conclusion is that for large vessels, there really is no safe speed. As I demonstrated by our estimates, of course, this is going to vary depending on the species you collide with and the vessels themselves. Um, a 10 knot speed limit might only drop the probability of lethality by about 10 or 15 percent. And um, that's not that's not enough to make a difference. So we are not going to solve the problem of vessel strikes with whales simply by controlling the speeds of these large vessels. We need to find ways to separate them. That's not to say that there's no value in slowing these vessels down. In fact, I also want to emphasize this is about um, looking at the probability of lethality if a collision occurs. The previous studies looking at ship speeds have identified 10 knots as a, as a, as a spot approximately around that 50% lethality. It is possible and some studies have demonstrated that ship speed might also affect the probability of a strike occurring. So a slower moving ship may actually give a whale the opportunity to avoid a collision better than a fast moving ship. That was not investigated in this, but that might account for some of the discrepancy in what we're finding compared to some of these previous studies. We are assuming a collision is occurring. <clears throat> and in this case, there is essentially no safe speed, you know, um, and, uh, and so moving the vessels is going gonna, is gonna to have to be the answer. A couple of other very quick things that we learned from this. One, of course, is we can see very clearly that velocity is important, which is the main thing that many of the previous studies have looked at. And this is indeed the case. Velocity is very important for determining how badly a collision is going to go for the whale. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and more importantly, the stresses that are going to be put on the whale. But not only is velocity important, area is important as well. The smaller the area that you make that collides with the whale, the higher that stress and the more dangerous it's going to be. Um, if you think about things with keels, and uh, you know, this is something that we've thought about too, is for example, relatively light, but very fast moving ocean going yachts occasionally have their keels and dagger boards ripped off because they've hit something in the ocean. It could be that, that those are also very important collisions that we're, we have not been paying enough attention to because that area, if you imagine um, that those, those dagger boards are like butter knives running through the ocean at about 30 knots and they can also be quite dangerous. <clears throat> An important thing that I learned that I thought was interesting is large is large, um, which sounds unusual, but on that graph that I showed you, there's very little difference between a 300 ton and a 30,000 ton um, vessel. And this just comes down to, once again, the sort of apparent analogy where it doesn't matter if I get hit with an SUV or I get hit with a fully loaded transport truck, both of those are going to be really bad situation for me. And that's the same situation with these whales. It doesn't matter how big the cargo vessel is. It's 10 a hundred or a thousand times heavier than the whales, it's going to be very dangerous for the whales. <clears throat> and, and one of the last things I want to mention too, is that small vessels can experience big G's in these collisions. And it is likely that if you're in a small vessel and you hit a whale, you probably know it. And, um, and in fact, people have been injured, uh, which the records have shown. And in fact, just as I was looking around for it, there was a news article from NOAA about a collision that occurred in June of this year in Alaska. Um, some family on a, on a pleasure craft collided with the whale and several members of the family had to go to the hospital. They were so seriously injured, likely knocked off their feet because of the sudden change in, in acceleration. Um, but uh, I, I didn't have any information on this, uh, on the collision, the type of vessel or the whale that was hit. I couldn't find any other information on it. This is some of the stuff that we would be interested in looking for and um, certainly can help improve 
this model and this work. We know that all whales are not necessarily the same. We know that there's not a lot of details on the tissue, the physical properties of the tissues of whales. It's entirely possible that humpback whale blubber is different from right whale blubber, which we know is heavily collagenized and, and all kinds of things. So there's a lot more improvement that we can do around this model, around some of these parameters and the variables too. Um, and as those become available, as well as improved observations of uh, uh, ship strikes and the fate of the whales that were struck by those ships, we may get a better understanding of this. But we felt it was very important to be able to produce this model because for species like North Atlantic right whales that are now down around 350 individuals, we can't afford to continue making observations before we decide just how important these, um, these collisions are or the physics that takes place in them. Um, I'm gonna conclude now. I wanna acknowledge uh, Dan Kelly and James Vlasic who are my co-authors on this and did all the heavy lifting on the, the physics and the Newtonian uh, physics and equations for dealing with these collisions. And, um, you know, it's, it was a, a real pleasure to do this cross discipline and collaborative work to try and come up with this um, very useful piece of information. Um, my email is there. If people have other questions, they can contact me. I'm happy to answer some now, of course, and I'll try and get to them in the, in, in the chat box. And furthermore, we look forward to more data and more publications and perhaps publications that can use this model and help improve and uh, improve its utility down the road for managing these situations. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. thank you very much, Sean. That was very interesting. Um, I see we do have a number of questions um, here waiting uh, to be asked, but let me just kind of start out and uh, follow up on this um, uh, think comments you made about uh, blubber types and so forth. So, you know, um, squishability presumably changes with co composition of blubber. Um, so how, how much do you think those sorts of factors, um, if they were included in a model, might change the outcome. Uh, do, do you think it's big or not, in a sense, not worth the effort going to that extent? Yeah, that's a real good question, uh, Daryl. You know, um, it does matter a lot. Of course, even when you play with our model as it exists, if you, if you thin up that blubber layer, that blubber layer is really important for absorbing some of that impact. And, and in in a surprising number of situations, it did seem to make a big difference. Of course, you've got a giant cargo vessel. I'm not talking about those, but those borderline ones, especially with small vessels, do make a big difference. And of course, there's lots of things that can affect blubber quality and thickness. I mean, lactation is one, illness or entanglement, uh, you know, uh, starvation can cause thinness, uh, thinning of the blubber as well and or illness. And we may find that other whales just have more soft, blubber compared to more thick, uh, bouncy blubber. So, um, so I think it's, it's kind of important. Um, I don't think that we would find any drastic changes in, um, in this model. I think the conclusions were, um, that, you know, the velocity in the areas were very important, but, you know, I think we'd be interested in, in knowing those differences and being able to acknowledge them and maybe account for some of the differences that we observe where maybe right whales can, handle more of a collision than humpbacks, for example, and that would only improve the model. Great, thank you. Um, let me, uh, instead of taking more questions from me at this point, let's turn it over to uh, those watching your presentation and uh, see what they have to say. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a lot of good questions. I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Um, and uh, the first one is, um, and I'm sure a lot of people have this about extrapolating downwards towards sort of medium sized and, and smaller cetaceans. Um, what do you think about doing that? Or well, I'll just leave it there. Yeah, well, we can definitely do that. The model um, can handle it. Uh, we, we mostly focused on large whales species, but if you um, go down to say killer whales or smaller, um, that wouldn't be difficult to do. One thing that happens is the smaller you get, in some ways, the less stress occurs because what happens is <clears throat> your body doesn't get compressed. Your whole body is just shoved out of the way. It's kind of like when you uh, swat a mosquito, just because I smack a mosquito, it doesn't actually kill it. It just knocks it away. So in some cases, um, once an animal is small enough, it can still, uh, I don't mean to undermine that, it can still be killed because of the collision. But in some cases, we've seen that surprisingly smaller cetaceans, animals, 
um, essentially will bounce off of these uh, larger vessels. But, um, but that's not always the case. But it is an interesting aspect of the physics where if there isn't a compression that's occurring, there are different physics aspects of physics that's involving and, and, uh, and the lethality might not be as high, but it would require some investigation for sure. Um, this next question, I'm gonna combine a few of these cause they get into sort of how, how this paper impacts some of the current thoughts about management. Um, so there was a lot of questions about sort of establishing or expanding areas to be avoided in, um, if it's looking like the slowdown is not as effective, but how has, you know, what are your thoughts on how do we adapt based on this information? And then my, my interest is how has a lot of work has gone into this vessel slowdown stuff? You know, how has that been from managers and industry sort of, have they seen this and, and had a chance to think about it? Um, yes, uh, I've been encouraged. I've um, here in Canada, we've kept Transport Canada, which is the government agency that deals with these things in, informed of the progress of this research all along, as well as the publication in the end. Um, you know, they do pay attention to these things and understand them. Um, this is a, such a very difficult proj, uh, problem. And I don't mean to make light of that or, or discount, for example, the, uh, the ship speed issues. Um, I believe what this is showing is that ship speed won't solve our problems. And I think that that's an important conclusion. I think that you know, not because of this research, but I wouldn't want the world to go, well, as long as we go 10 knots, we know we're not going to be a serious injury to whales. Well, now we know that's not true. We actually need to continue to try and find ways uh, to, to prevent these injuries from happening. What are the other solutions? <clears throat> Certainly moving vessels away from whales is a great idea. We've also had discussions about, can we redesign ships so they have crumple zones for whales? Can we put cow catchers on the front of ships so that they don't actually kill whales when they hit them because area is an important thing? I think that, I hope that this research just basically shows that we can't rest on our laurels. We can't think that we've solved this problem. And here's a number of factors that help maybe show the way towards new directions that help, might help mitigate uh, this, this ship strike issue. Um, but it's not to say that, it's not to say that speed restrictions don't help. Clearly they do. We can show that they do. And as I said, they may also have an effect on the probability of the ship strike, which we didn't investigate. So I don't want to discourage those, but I feel quite confident that we are not going to solve this problem only by using ship strikes. And I hope that this research encourages consideration of other management tools. Great. Um, there was one question specifically about the data and, and where you go to access um, uh, the ship strike or the collision data. It looked like there was primarily laced and maybe one other resource for that. Um, but adding on to that, is there is there inform more information that people could be collecting during these times that would, you know, during collisions or at like, or is it just so many are unknown and, and it just happens and ships aren't aware? Well, no, of course, I think we will benefit if we can collect more information on this. I understand the IWC has a, a large whale database that they're building, um, but it's still being built. We weren't able to access that. Um, but you know, the more, the, the more observations that we can build into this, the better we'll be able to understand it. I don't think we can wait for more information before we act on, on the, this knowledge to try and prevent the ship strikes, but we might as well get as much information from that as we can. And what's important is knowing the size of the ship and the speed, um, the size of the whale, and whether or not the whale survived or not. Those are almost the most crucial things that are gonna allow us to at least make these estimates. So it still makes sense. You're right, there was very limited data laced Jensen and Silber, there were a few other, uh, I think, no reports. Um, there were only 34 data points. So, you know, if that was to grow or once the data from the IWC is available, if we can expand that database, it would be a very simple thing to modify that logistic curve and make better estimates of what this lethality could be. But it is certainly important. I would encourage that we continue to get as much information as possible from all of these events. Okay, I'm going to. Um this is the danger of talking about physics. We're going to challenge you uh, with something to see if you can calculate in your head. Um, uh, Bertrand asked, <laughs> it's a really interesting presentation, um, but asked, do you know what distance a 300 ton ship, for instance, would need to change its trajectory at a speed of 10 knots 
compared to 20 knots? Yeah. Um, no, but um, I did read a paper about it. <laughs> um, there was there's recently been a paper that looked at the reactiveness and maneuverability of large cargo vessels um, to the detection of a whale somewhere in, in its track. I don't recall what the change in velocity is, but basically a, what I do recall, I will encourage you to go find the paper, um, is that a large cargo vessel detects a whale. How much uh, time do they need or distance do they need to course correct and miss the whale? The, the, the number was between 1.8 and two kilometers. So a little over a mile, almost two miles. Um, and that assumes that the whale doesn't move, of course, because then the vessel has time to move around it. So this is the, obviously the biggest challenge is that at cruising speed, these large cargo vessels can't stop very well uh, and don't have a lot of maneuverability. Conversely, the relatively smaller vessels, I always call them smaller vessels, but they're only relatively smaller. They're much, much bigger than a whale or much bigger than me. Um, you know, a, a Cape Islander fishing vessel at full speed, if you cut the throttle, that thing's gonna stop within about 30 meters, it'll come to a stop. And similarly, it's much more maneuverable. So big differences in, in these ships and these require different management approaches. So um, I've kind of avoided that question, haven't I? There is a paper about it and uh, uh, I have read it and I would encourage you to look into the literature. I know of at least one paper that, that examined that question. Well dodged, well dodged. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate all these questions. Thank you for your attention, this is wonderful. Uh, Daryl, I still got a couple more. Do you want to jump in, or do you want me to keep going? Uh, well, let me just let me jump in with one and, and sort of ask you, uh, Sean. Um, so there obviously is information we've gotten from you on um, based on your model um, that is food for thought in terms of mitigation measures and so forth. But so. Um, how do you see your model as being used beyond for the information you've given us um, now and in the paper? Um, are there other ways in which you see your model being um, valuable for managers um, otherwise? I, I can think of a couple ways, but I really want to encourage think, people to think creatively, and, and I don't expect I'll be the only one that could think of novel ways. <clears throat> There's a couple in particular. One is rather than just simply modeling vessel speed as an index of lethality, this model allows us to actually model the stress that a ship is potentially exposing to whales if a collision occurs. So you might be able to identify uh, uh, vessels of certain characteristics as having to move slower, for example, or maybe not having to move as slow to transit an area and to be safe. So that's one way of if you imagine mapping the dangerousness of these vessels based on the stress that they might cause if a collision occurs. I think another thing that's interesting is, um, I think the point that I was making about the, um, the broken bones is a thing. Like if we find a, a whale was killed and uh, you know its ribs or its mandible was broken, what this model will do is it'll allow us to rule out vessels. Like there are some vessels that will not be able to generate the stresses required to crack the mandible of a large whale. And so you can rule out certain vessels. So, um, you know, not simply is this a matter of saying, oh, can a vessel harm a whale or not? In some cases, it, it can actually rule out certain vessels in certain accidents because it's impossible for that vessel to have generated enough stress to cause the damage that we saw on this whale. So I think those are, are two examples that I've thought of where this model is certainly going to be useful to inform um, in events, you know, in kind of a CSI kind of a post uh, mortem examination. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, great. Thank you, Sean. Um, Charles, go ahead if you've got others. Um, yeah, the first one uh, is a good call out to marine mammal scientists to help fill in the gaps. So uh, the question is, since information on marine mammal tissue properties is currently limited, what was used for the right whale blubber bone, et cetera, and to potentially expand the model to include other species, what should the marine mammal community collect? Mm. Oh my goodness, great question. We looked for this quite a bit. We found um, one paper by uh, Sol de Villa who looked at material properties of a bottlenosed whale actually and demonstrated a stress strain relationship of the blubber of that whale. And so we used that stress strain relationship uh, as, an, as an applicable relationship between stress and strain for blubber in general. 
clearly this is an assumption. Um, we think it would be very useful. We hope to do some, but gosh, I'd love it if someone else could do measurements on the physical properties of blubber. You know, what is the stress strain relationship on blubber as you compress it down to nothing? What happens if you release that? How does it come back, for example? Um, similarly, blubber is different from muscle, perhaps. Uh, there was a previous study that, that examined uh, using a, a finite element model where they actually looked at this and assumed that the blubber had the same physical characteristics as the tissue. So we assumed the same thing for, whale, uh, for right whales. That may not be the case. I wouldn't be surprised if that's different. Uh, and so these are some of the things that would be really helpful if, if other people were examining these. You know, the flexibility of the skin, we made some assumptions. Um, in fact, I think we used an estimate from uh, maybe dolphin skin and seal skin to understand the tearing, how much stress and force is necessary before the skin tears. That information is just not available for whales. So um, we did have to Frankenstein this a little bit with pieces of uh, other animals together, kind of a Jurassic Park kind of uh, situation, not as dangerous. Um, but uh, hopefully these still are estimating within a reasonable amount, but I really do encourage if there's more measurements out there that will only help improve this model and we can, we can refine those parameters very easily. Thank you for asking because that'll be very helpful if we could get that stuff. Um, okay, uh, next question is from Eric Archer. This is an interesting one. Um, could the model be used to sum the stress on a whale over the length of contact between whale and ship? So that's the contact outside of the initial impact. So I guess as it's dragging, if it's you know stuck on the bow or? Um, I think so. Um, what, what gets complicated, of course, as you can imagine, is that, and there has been other papers that have looked at this, is that uh, if a whale interacts with the ship, does it get pushed along in front of the ship? Does it get pulled underneath or knocked off to the side? Each of these would produce a different situation. I would say, yes, you could, but you got to be prepared for multiple scenarios. And, and I don't know what the physics would be like, the, the hydrodynamic forces that might be involved in pushing a whale in one direction or another. Um, but you probably could. I, I feel like, you know, we felt pretty good that um, for the most part, our estimates we feel here are uh, mostly underestimates, I think, because we have simplified it to a, a single the first incidence of collision, for example, and we've not accounted for tearing or lacerations or anything. So we feel like we're being fairly conservative in these estimates, but you could definitely expand this model and, and, and address those things. You'd need to be much more familiar with fluid dynamics than I am, but uh, I think it could be done. Um, okay, and I meant to ask this one a little bit earlier. It's about, I guess, I think it's uh, the GUI interface, but do you have, um, there was a drop down box that, you know, said um, North Pacific or North Atlantic right whales. Um, do you have calculations for blue whales built into this or those yeah. are in there? So we, we went to, um, well, we, I think we took it from three or four different papers. Lockyer comes to mind where there are a number of length weight uh, equations that have been published for whale, different species of whales. And we just used those equations. We used updated ones where we could find them. So all that does is it, it takes that simple equation from one of those other papers and you set a whale, to, a right whale to 13 meters, it's gonna say, for example, 30 tons. You call it a humpback at 13 meters, it's gonna say 25 tons or something. So it, it, um, it's all in there. Um, and I think we focused on large whales. So there's maybe 12 or, or 15 different species of large whales. Um, as I said, I don't think we've put in like small cetaceans or um, there might not even be killer whales that are in there. Maybe there is, but that might be the smallest citation that we put in there. So yeah, you pull that do drop down menu, it just selects a different length weight relationship so that when you move that sliding bar, you're just simply reporting the length of the animal and it calculates the estimated mass. Okay, we are starting to get to um, fewer ones and, and these last ones go back to the management um, side of things. And, and I think for maybe for some, it might be good to, if you can summarize succinctly, kind of what the management practices are right now in terms of existing ship speeds and whether they're seasonal. There was a question about what we know about annual movements and habitat use during different times of the day, et cetera, kind of how that feeds into the current regime. Um, and then the follow-on is if you can talk about a little bit more about uh, you 
this question came in right before you talked about the yachts, but are there other vessels to consider as, as, as well? Great. Um, I'm trying to answer these quickly so I can get to other questions, but this one's very interesting. Um, I, 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 I will tell you what I know. I won't confess to be a global expert on everything that's being done for, for vessels. Mostly it's large vessels. In fact, I'll tell you what's going on here in Canada and many of the same principles are used elsewhere. In Canada, vessels that come into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, for example, there are a number of parts of the Gulf of St. Lawrence that have speed restrictions and there are some parts that don't. There are international maritime organization designations in parts of the world here in Canada. We have an IMO area to be avoided, an ATBA, which is an area that has been identified as a common presence of right whales again, and ships are recommended to avoid it, but it's not a necessary avoiding. The establishment of shipping lanes is important. We have shipping lanes that go through the Bay of Fundy into uh, Port of St. John. Um, this was altered uh, through IMO so that the vessels skirt around a known or a previously known concentration of where right whales occurred, for example. So vessel restriction, uh, speed restrictions are important. Typically around the world, I think it seems to be about vessels 20 meters and larger. Here in Canada, I think um, this research helped inform the idea that maybe we got to start dealing with vessels smaller than that. So these restrictions apply to vessels 13 meters and larger, that's about 45 feet and larger. And um, uh, so there are IMO tools, um, federal agencies such as Transport Canada have tools for managing both the speeds and the locations of where vessels are allowed to go. Transport Canada has also established a restricted area where vessels are not allowed to go at all because of the presence of whales too. So these are the range of tools that are used. The easiest, I believe, and the the most preferred, as much as it isn't preferred at all, is speed restrictions. Um, and, uh, and as I said, I think these have some value, um, but they don't have as much value as we think. And so we really need to start looking at these other possible management measures, specifically around avoiding going to areas where there are whales. In some cases, this is very difficult. For example, the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, is essentially a highway running through the middle of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And we have relatively dense um, um, numbers, high densities of whales in both the southern and northern part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So they are crossing this highway at some point. So it's not an easy way for us to, uh, to manage it. Um, on the question of uh, high speed light vessels. So uh, Volvo Ocean Race, for example, or these different ocean racing events, these are big giant yachts. They only weigh about 20 tons. They're very light, but they're ripping through the ocean at 30 knots or faster, you know. And furthermore, they'll have dagger boards or hydrofoils in the water. These things can be two meters uh, in height, but only maybe 30 centimeters wide. And so if you think back to the model that we were just talking about, if you take something that's 30 centimeters wide and a couple meters high, and you run it through the ocean at uh, 30 knots, even if there's not a lot of weight to it, that small of area is likely going to cause a lot of damage. Now, what actually happens is these things tend to break off. We've not looked at the forces that are involved in breaking these off. That might be an interesting thing to look at because it might give us a sense of the stresses that are involved. I should say stresses. I get my uh, physics units wrong all the time. The stresses that are involved in tearing a, a dagger board or a keel off of a boat will also define the stress that was exposed, that the whale was exposed to. This happens regularly. A couple of years ago, there was a race, I'm forgetting, out of Rhode Island crossing the Atlantic Ocean and in the middle of the night, several of these high-speed vessels ran into something. Nobody knows what. Could be logs, could be basking sharks, could be turtles, could be whales sleeping at the surface. Several of them ran into something and had their dagger boards ripped off and they all had to limp into Rhode Island or New York or something to get repairs. And at the same time, I know they dread this and I have had a number of racing skippers and captains talk to me about hitting whales and seeing a whale swimming away bleeding. I know that they hate this. I know that there's a lot of work right now uh, with these transoceanic race organizations to pay close attention to where whale concentrations are, to give warnings to the captain so that they know where they need to avoid and where might be safe and where is more dangerous and those areas to avoid. So I think that there's quite a lot of work going into this right now and it's not being, it's not being ignored, um, but I hope work like this will help inform that as well. But that's a great question. That's another thing that we've been thinking about as well.
Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat box. Please, anybody in the Q&A box, please throw them in if you have them. We are getting close to the end of the time. But I do have uh, just one question that probably should have been asked earlier. So um, the speed reduction measures went in. You started to look at these, uh, the necropsies on these animals that were injured um, but didn't have the associated broken bones and, and that severe trauma. Um, has the number of cases like that increased? Like, I guess, kind of as a measure of, yes, it's it's a metric of success that that the ships have slowed down and they're doing less substantial substantial trauma, but it's still sufficient sufficiently lethal. But is that non broken bone becoming more apparent? Mm. We haven't seen that just yet. Um, <clears throat> the frustrating situation here in Canada in managing these right whales is that a number of these very good ideas are being put in place. So um, the, as I said, there is a, 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 a quilt, a mosaic of, of ship speed rules and restrictions through the Gulf of St. Lawrence during the time when the whales are here. We had a good year this year, so there were no <clears throat> right whales that were struck and killed. And so, um, so that was good. But last year we had nine animals that died here. Not all of them die from ship strike. Um, some may be entanglement, but some are also ship strike. Several were identified as ship strike last year. Um, there isn't enough data to really see if that's happening or not. That's a, an excellent point though. I mean, if it might even be a good test of this model. If indeed slower speeds don't reduce lethality, but perhaps reduce broken bones, um, one, form of evidence that perhaps the speed restrictions is working is maybe we don't, maybe we won't see a reduction in mortality, but we might see that necropsy show that there are fewer broken bones happening in these whales. So that's a, that's an interesting way of looking at maybe whether or not these decisions are, are working enough, but that the, the nasty part of this decision is just figuring out where to put those whales. We need to continue to use the ocean, both for fishing and for shipping, of course, um, we just need to make sure that we're making better decisions about how to do that so that we don't accidentally drive species to extinction because we're not, you know, we're not paying attention to them. And so it's a, it's a difficult thing to deal with. Um, I think that's a great idea. We haven't seen it yet enough data to answer whether or not that's making a difference. Last one, I, I promise, and then hand it back over to Daryl. Uh, Bertrand uh, wants to know, how well do ships respect the speed reduction in the Gulf of St. Lawrence? <clears throat> Um, I would say pretty good. Um, the, the speed restrictions in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, there is a voluntary speed restriction area at the front of the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the Cabot Strait. Um, and then there are a number of mandatory ones throughout the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The reports from Transport Canada is that compliance for these mandatory ones are quite good. This is a pattern that we also see in the US with the speed restrictions that are used down there as well. The Compliance with the voluntary speed restriction is not what I would consider great. Um, it's not a passing mark in school grades. It's just under, I think it's around or just under 50% compliance compared to many of the other ones that are sort of in the 70 to 80 or more percent compliance for the mandatory ones. So um, compliance isn't bad when they know that they need to do it. Um, when, they, when they see it as a voluntary thing, um, compliance isn't quite as good. And so, you know, I don't want to speculate on why that may be the case. I know that the issue, well, I'll, t I'll say you one thing. <clears throat> I know the issue is that the mariners are not trying to run down whales. Um, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, these are <clears throat> international mariners bringing vessels from international bodies through these international seaways. They're following all of the uh, mandatory safety and compliance rules. They are paying attention to the weather and the currents and the depths. Safety is number one uh, for them. And in some cases, if something is a low priority or a voluntary situation, they may see it as a low priority and it doesn't get the attention that it deserves, for example, in this case. And, uh, and sometimes they're just not aware of it. And so communication is important. And in some cases, making things mandatory to, to demonstrate the importance that they're complied with is also important. So, um, so pretty good compliance, I would say, when the rules are mandatory. And this is the same pattern that's found in the US as well with voluntary speed restrictions in the US. There just isn't great compliance. And um, you know, we, we, I'm sure we see the same thing with all of us who drive vehicles. We need to be a bit more attentive and responsible uh, at following those mandatory versus recommended speed limits, right? 
Great, uh, Daryl, I will hand it over to you. All right, well, thank you, uh, Charles. And uh, Sean, thank you very much um, for a great talk. I, I, uh, I think it's interesting that, um, you know, you, you started out to clearly indicating your motivation for this was North Atlantic right whales, even though there are broader applications and, and uses of this. Um, uh, I think, you know, when we have species like the North Atlantic right whale, where uh, every single whale uh, harmed, um, not able to reproduce or survive, um, is, is critical to deal with. So one has to find as many ways as possible to learn more about the issue, about the things that kill them and um, how we might be able to uh, deal with mitigating these problems. So yeah. uh, r really important uh, work that you're doing and uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Enjoyed, yeah. enjoyed your talk. In, in, you know, in these cases, the right whale is a very crucial one. It's, it's really just a model that we can use to, to get a better understanding of a problem that's much bigger than right whales. Um, in, in Eastern Canada and, and New England, this North Atlantic right whale is a big issue, of course, locally. Um, but really, the issue is not the right whale. The issue is the way we're using the ocean. If the right whale, unfortunately, disappeared, and hopefully doesn't, but if it ever disappeared, this problem would still be here. There would just be another species in the line. Maybe it's humpbacks, maybe it's blue whales, maybe it's fin whales. So, you know, um, the, the right whale is sort of the, the, the subject currently, but only because it's so crucial and it's at the front of the line. And I think that the tools that we're learning for all of these situations is something that's applicable, hopefully, globally for all kinds of species. So thank you for mentioning that. That's uh, very astute. That's great. Okay, excellent. Let me, uh, uh, before we sign off here, let me put in a pitch for uh, next month's seminar. Um, we already have uh, someone lined up, uh, Dr. Trevor Branch, who will be uh, talking about uh, sex ratios in blue whales. And uh, I think Charles has in the chat um, uh, a link to that paper. Um, we are having, if papers aren't open access, we are having the papers uh, open uh, by our publisher Wiley um, a week before the seminar and for a week after a seminar. So also remember you can uh, get access to uh, Sean and his colleagues papers for another week if you don't have uh, access to marine mammal science otherwise. So Sean, thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, having lots of people next month for our next seminar. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, with that, good night.